Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless jesus said as a sign of his coming and the end of the age there would be an increase in deception false christ who will deceive many wars and rumors of wars nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom famines pestilences earthquakes christian persecution apostasy false prophets and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor as the labor progresses the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes as we get closer to jesus return all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense all of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time Jesus, speaking to his disciples about the signs of his coming and the end of the age, declares this in Matthew 24, 12. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. The Bible tells us lawlessness is the violation of God's commandments, as we read in 1 John 3, 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Sin will be so rampant and so commonplace in the last days that the love people once had for one another, for many, will be non-existent. In this prophecy, Jesus Christ is describing an ongoing breakdown in the relationship with God. And since people's love for God is waning, it will be evident in the way people treat one another as well. A symptom may be that the love toward other people is decreasing, but the real cause is that the relationship with God is cooling off. This is what we are witnessing in our world today. Tonight, video capturing the moment gunfire erupted in Tampa. The horrifying sound of gunshots sending people running for their lives. There are multiple patients shot all the way down the block. Moments later, victims in bloody Halloween costumes receiving help from first responders. And all two people were killed, 16 others injured. Authorities say despite heavy police presence in the area, the shooting started after a fight broke out. People aren't hesitating to pull out guns and and shoot and not only kill innocent individuals, but hurt bystanders as well. One of the two killed was Emmett Wilson's 14 year old son. It's not the first time I done lost a child. 2014, I lost my child. Now here it is 2023 and my baby boy, he's he's gone now from gun violence. Police announcing today 22-year-old Tyrell Stephen Phillips has been arrested and charged with second-degree murder. Gun violence erupting at Halloween parties in other cities as well this weekend. In Texarkana, Texas, three people were killed and three others injured. In Indianapolis, one person killed and 10 others injured. And in Chicago, 15 people shot at a Halloween house party. Tragedies overshadowing celebrations for one of America's favorite holidays. The Apostle Paul in his epistle to Timothy tells us in the last days society will be in a total immoral meltdown. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. You've heard of smash and grab robberies. Now comes crash and grab. Police say bad guys wearing masks intentionally rammed into a car in L.A. just to rob the driver. As Jim Murray reports, it was so dramatic, witnesses thought they had wandered onto a movie set. You're watching a crash and grab robbery after cops say these masked men intentionally rammed a vehicle off the road. The bewildered victim, the driver of an Alfa Romeo, puts his hands in the air and kneels. The chaotic scene unfolded in broad daylight in Los Angeles, where smash and grab robberies have become an all too common occurrence. But a crash and grab on a busy freeway seems like a new low. 
The brazen thieves go through the victim's smashed up car. This witness recorded the unbelievable robbery. Did you hear the thieves say anything to the victim? The only thing I hear, they said, where's the uh, jewels? So where's the jewels, they say. So it was clear to you that those thieves knew what they were after. Exactly. This eyewitness boldly walks right up, recording the heist as it unfolds. Hey, don't move. Hey, stay there. The thieves seem befuddled, searching for something, even scanning the area outside of the vehicle. They finally make their way to the getaway car, a white Chevrolet Malibu. It appears that it was uh, targeted. Sleek beachfront hotels in Acapulco now in ruins after Hurricane Otis ravaged the area. We are living in a very difficult situation and help has not arrived. It's the strongest storm ever to make landfall on Mexico's Pacific coast and the popular tourist destination, home to nearly a million people now struggling to recover. The death toll jumping to 45 people, according to the state's governor, with dozens more still missing. Military officials saying dozens of boats sank and still more washed up on the shore. The marina completely devastated. We tried to save the boats, but with these winds, we were unable to save any of them. They were big yachts, about 80 feet. They all disappeared. Now, frustration with the government's response growing as residents say they're left to fend for themselves. Many flocking to makeshift shelters, lining up for hours for a chance to get food and water. Stores looted out of desperation for for basic necessities. This woman pleading for help from the international community. We don't have anything anymore. They looted everything. Not all of us looted. We really need help. There's nobody here. The government saying 6,500 soldiers are working to keep the peace and help with the aid. Otis's rapid transition from a tropical storm to a Category 5 hurricane happened in just 12 hours, leaving Acapulco residents with little time to prepare, winds gusting up to 165 miles per hour. The Mexican president detailing that not a single power line remained standing in the affected areas. Helicopters. This morning, telling the country helicopters are being used to bring in new utility poles and get the power running as soon as possible, with the president also announcing a tanker carrying gasoline has arrived to help with the fuel shortage. But that will be just another early step in a long rebuilding process, with the cost of the destruction potentially reaching $15 billion. Just as this community's core tourist season approaches, the Mexican Hotel Association telling the Associated Press 80% of the hotels in the area have been damaged. A rare scene in Brazil's Amazon, home to the world's largest rainforest. Families walking kilometers on dry sand, until recently covered by the Sulimões River, queuing for food and water. We are suffering. The drought has dried up the river. We must walk half an hour to fetch the food packages and water the government has sent us and carry them home on our backs. The most severe drought in 120 years has isolated entire communities in a region that depends on its rivers for transportation. Sixty cities in the Amazon are in a state of emergency and more than 600,000 people are being affected by the drought. Scientists say that this drought has been caused by the natural phenomenon El Niño, but that climate change is making things much worse. No doubt that all over the, the planet, the climate extremes are becoming more frequent and also record-breaking climate extremes all over the planet. This year is the record-breaking heat wave in the planet. Meanwhile, in the Amazon, Brazilians are waiting for the rainy season. Although scientists say this year, it may take longer to come. Psalm 107, 33 and 34. He turns rivers into a wilderness, and the water springs into dry ground, a fruitful land into barrenness, for the wickedness of those who dwell in it. Summer's record heat and drought is expected to push food prices up by at least 5% this year, according to a Department of Agriculture forecast. And as CBS's Mark Strassman reports, farmers are now reaping a harvest that's meager at best. Van Hanserling grows peanuts and cotton, but this Mississippi farmer is harvesting a disaster. It probably took two-thirds of the cotton crop and, and probably half the peanut crop. I've been farming for over 40 years and 
and I've never seen anything like this. His losses alone, about $1.2 million. Too much heat, too little rain. This one's got a, a, a piece of a bean in it. This summer's same one-two punch that knocked down Jack Dorsey's soybean harvest in neighboring Louisiana. He calls soybeans poverty peas. Everything hurts on a farm if, if uh, you're not getting everything, all the potential out of your crop. Over the summer here in Franklin Parish, 27 days of triple-digit heat baked crops. Making matters worse, between mid-July and the end of August, no rain for nearly six weeks, not one drop. Another issue for these soybean fields. It never really cooled down at night during the scorcher of a summer. That further stressed these beans, which further stressed these farmers. Summer extremes hit farms from California to Minnesota to Mississippi. Its impact hitting farmers like Daly and consumers like us. They say green is the color of money, and that's certainly true for Dorian Klombang as he wades through his paddy field, picking out weeds. When this goes to market, he's expecting a 30% increase on the price last year. We farmers are happy to see the price go up. We can use the money to pay expenses and debts. Drought earlier in the year prompted concerns that India's rice supply wouldn't meet domestic demands. But the government's actions have had a knock-on effect beyond the border. In Malaysia, prices have gone up by 20 to 30 percent in the past month. Supermarkets still have plenty of stock, but smaller shops have been struggling to fill their shelves without the purchasing power of the large retail chains. That's hurting the people who can least afford it, those who rely on street food or who feed large families. Farmers in central Thailand are doing everything they can to capitalize. Exports are already up 10 percent, and they're trying to squeeze in a third harvest before the end of the year. But the long-term indicators aren't good. Storage facilities that should be full are almost empty. Speculators are hoarding supplies, hoping prices will rise even higher. Normally, this warehouse would be full of rice, these huge sacks piled right up to the rafters. This year, it's empty. Sales are up 40%, and they're selling the rice faster than they can grow it. Outside, a board advertises the highest price Thai rice farmers have seen for years. But there's barely enough chaff for the pigeons, waiting eagerly in the courtyard. We are currently living in a time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. We are fast approaching a time known as the tribulation, that Jesus says will be the worst time in human history, as we read in Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No nor ever shall be. We are currently witnessing events that will continue to become more frequent and more intense until God pours out his final judgments on an unbelieving and unrepentant world. One of the judgments described in the book of Revelation includes the price of food being so high and scarce that it will cost a full day's wages just to barely get enough to eat as we read in Revelation 6, 5, and 6. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. In this prophecy, it will cost a day's wages just for a loaf of bread. We are not in the tribulation period yet, but we are getting extremely close. Amos 8.11 Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God that it will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Even worse than a famine of physical food is a famine of spiritual food. Because Israel rejected the prophets, God promised a severe judgment. Just as Israel rejected the prophets, the church today is rejecting God's word. How tragic to turn a deaf ear to God and be given a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. Well, President Biden and Chinese President Xi expected to meet on the sidelines of the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit in just a couple of weeks. So let's take a look at the recent conflicts that are putting the United States at odds with the communist regime. China has increased military presence on Taiwan, launching air and sea military drills around the island. The regime has been providing crucial support for Russia's war effort in Ukraine, expanding its purchase of Russian oil and gas since Moscow invaded Ukraine last year.
year. And China is one of the primary sources of fentanyl that is trafficked into the United States. Last year, more than 82,000 Americans died because of the drug. And who can forget the Chinese spy flight that spent a week hovering over the United States early this year. Those are just a few of the recent examples. So on that note, let's bring in the Hudson Institute senior fellow and foreign policy expert, Rebecca Heinrich, to uh, to weigh in on all of this. I would also add to your great list that China has been si almost completely silent when it comes to Iran-backed uh, terrorist activity against U.S. Um, military bases and, of course, Iran-backed uh, proxy attacks against uh, uh, Israel. And so we know that China essentially backs the Palestinian, uh, the uh, terrorist attacks against, um, against Israel. And so really we've seen a developing axis between China, Russia, and Iran. China inserting itself into the Israeli Hamas conflict, calling for a peace deal, sending six ships to the Middle East ahead of their top diplomat visiting Washington this week. I'll let China speak for their foreign policy in the region and, uh, uh, and whatever their, their take is. I, I, I've seen them call for both sides to, to ratchet down the, the violence. Uh, We've, we've been clear about where we are, and we're on Israel's side here. Israel needs this support to go after Hamas terrorists. That's not going to change. And I'll let them speak to their naval maneuvers and, and where they're putting their ships. But an op-ed in the New York Post says China is stoking a new Cold War with the West. Quote, China is following the same playbook in the Middle East that it did in Russia. Secretly encourage an attack on a U.S. ally or potential ally and promise to aid the aggressor behind the scenes. Senior fellow at the Gatestone Institute and author of China is Going to War, Gordon Chang, joins me now. Gordon, what is Xi Jinping's endgame here? Xi Jinping's endgame is to rule, not dominate, but to rule the world. And in the interim, he's using a number of Maoist tactics because he admires Mao. One of those tactics is to create chaos. Mao Zedong said chaos would eventually bring about worldwide Chinese rule. And the other is to encircle the cities by the countryside. And really what he is doing is Ukraine, Israel, North Africa, these are the countryside. The city in the Xi Jinping conception of it is the United States. So he seeks to starve the United States into submission. How specifically does the Hamas attack help Xi achieve his endgame? Well, certainly it creates chaos uh, and the brutality, the rape, all the, the atrocities. Really what this does is it destroys the whole notion of civilization and also global norms. If Xi Jinping can take down global norms, then he levels the playing field because the United States stands behind that international system. And Xi Jinping is hoping to bring about uh, greater Chinese influence in the intermediate term and eventually Chinese rule. Is the Biden administration being naive hosting Chinese officials while China, let's call it what it is, they're arming Iran right now and Iran is then arming Hamas? Yes, and Chinese weapons are now starting to show up in the hands of Iranian militants, such as the Houthis, such as Hamas. Um, and clearly, the Biden administration, while the Chinese attack everybody, um, is trying to establish lines of communication, trying to placate the Chinese. Clearly, the Biden administration doesn't want to recognize this. They won't even call China an adversary, as China, for instance, backs the fentanyl gangs, which are killing about 70, 75,000 Americans a year. This is just horrific policy. And the reason why China has been doing so well over the last couple of years is because Biden, for many reasons, has been helping um, uh, China and the Chinese proxies, such as Iran. That is just bad policy all around. We have never seen such a collapse of America's standing in the world um, in such a short period of time. And it's because of Biden's misguided, naive, feeble, call it what you want, but these policies are not in our interest. I have never been more worried about China than at this moment. It actually keeps me up at night, Gordon, and it's scary. Israelis are celebrating a hostage rescue in Gaza. An IDF soldier taken captive on October 7th has been reunited with her family. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Netanyahu continues to stand strong against calls for a ceasefire, vowing that Israel will never surrender to tyranny and terror. Israeli ground forces are now advancing on Gaza City, a Hamas stronghold, while a wave of anti-Semitism is surging around the world. CBN's Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem. This is the joyous reunion between Private Ori Megadish and her grandmother. 
Her neighbors came to celebrate, and many even took to the streets. Private Orime Gedish has reunited with her family. She is now home in Israel, but 238 hostages are not. The IDF chief spokesman reminded the world that many more remain in captivity. The Israel Defense Forces has a moral obligation to do anything and everything to bring every hostage home. We are operating on the ground in Gaza and doing everything necessary to free the hostages from Hamas and free Gaza from Hamas. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu addressed the foreign media by saying Israel's war with Hamas is a battle of civilizations. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says that there is a time for peace and a time for war. This is a time for war, a war for our common future. Today we draw a line between the forces of civilization and the forces of barbarism. It is a time for everyone to decide where they stand. Israel will stand against the forces of barbarism until victory. Netanyahu views October 7th as a global line in the sand. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a turning point, a turning point for leaders and nations. It is time for all of us to decide if we are willing to fight for a future of hope and promise or surrender to tyranny and terror. Now rest assured, Israel will fight. And that fight is spreading far beyond Israel and the Gaza Strip, from an anti-Semitic mob hunting Jews at a Russian airport to tens of thousands in this pro-Palestinian march in London. In the U.S., college campuses are the scene of anti-Semitic incidents. At Cooper Union in New York, a group of Jewish students forced to barricade themselves from a pro-Palestinian group. While at Cornell University, officials sent police to guard a Jewish center and kosher dining hall after post-threatening violence against Jewish students appeared on a website not affiliated with the school. I mean, it's worse than I've ever seen it, Chris, in terms of just the temperature of the anger and how it's spilling over into, into very real-world hate. That's the view from Laura Atkins, opinion editor of the Jewish publication The Forward. She tells CBN News about spending three weeks chronicling Israelis who went through the horrors of October 7th. It feels good to be able to give back by helping tell people's stories and sit with people that are in sometimes the worst days of their lives. But uh, I won't pretend that I'm not afraid with all of the anti-Semitism we're seeing, all of the just hate and vitriol and misinformation. It's, it's a really frightening time to be, to be Jewish. Psalm 2, 1 through 12. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all those who put their trust in him. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A, admit that you're a sinner. B, believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C, call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin 
He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.